Unlike much of ancient literature, which revels in tales of death-surviving heroes, titanic monsters, and a wide range of monstrous demons, the Hebrew Bible, or the Christian Old Testament, the largest extant library of Israelite literature, is remarkably terse in this regard. While oblique references to supernatural creatures, sea monsters, wilderness spirits, or even the ever-popular Nephilim are peppered throughout the text, perhaps one of the more referenced such beings are perhaps also the poorest understood, the Rephaim. This is, at least in part, because of the confusing appearance of these beings in Israelite literature. At times, powerful warriors of monstrous size and appearance locked in combat with Israelite warriors, and at other times, they appear to be ancient heroes or kings in the most remote regions of Sheol, the Israelite afterlife. Even more odd still, their name, at least at first blush, appears to mean something like the healers or the healed ones. All this combined creates an incredibly confusing portrait of beings mentioned around 30 times over 10 different Israelite texts, more than any such comparable beings. Who were the mysterious Rephaim? In this episode, we'll dive deep into the Bronze Age writings found at Dugaret, the tomb inscriptions of the Phoenicians, and of course, the puzzling narratives of the Hebrew Bible to better understand these mysterious beings. If you're interested in ancient magic, occult practices, or alchemy, Kabbalah, or Gnosticism, make sure to subscribe, check out my other content on topics in esotericism as well, including curated playlists. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content like this on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and your support of this channel is the only thing that makes it possible. I really do appreciate your consideration for supporting the channel. But now, let's turn to the mysterious Rephaim. Ancient giants, kings of the dead, monstrous heroes, or, or something else entirely. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The nature of the Rephaim has puzzled scholars and readers of the Bible for millennia. Even the ancient translators of the Bible to Greek and Aramaic from the original Hebrew weren't even really sure how to render the term. By then it was already mysterious to those ancient scholars. Sometimes they rendered it as giants, titans, healers, and in other cases they just transliterated it rather than actually trying to make any translation at all. Over the centuries, more than a dozen distinct concepts of these beings has emerged. Everything from the shades of the dead, to powerful ancient heroes, giants, uh, even a specific ethnic group, ancestor spirits, and even to supernatural physicians, and more. Of course, the origin of the difficulty lies in, one, the puzzling variety of the forms that these beings seem to take in the Hebrew Bible, and two, their very name. Like many Semitic words, Rephaim is the masculine plural from the triliteral root Resh Pe Aleph, which by the later Iron Age does mean something like to heal in the medical sense, though the earlier meaning of the root seemed to mean something closer to to mend or to stitch together, to repair. In fact, it still has that meaning in Arabic, Hebrew, and Ethiopian. If one were to travel back in time to wind back the clock to the Bronze Age, the word had an even more broad meaning, meaning something more like to make whole, to render intact, thus metaphorically to mean something like to be perfected, or perhaps best of all, to be flawless, 
both in a moral and a value sense rather than in a medical sense. Thus, to peer back before the puzzling nature of the Rephaim found in the Hebrew Bible, we have to look much, much further back in time to the myth history of the Bronze Age world of Canaanite Ugarit. First excavated in the 1930s, the site of Ras Shamra U Ugarit is our best glimpse into the world of Bronze Age Canaanite culture, especially the literature of that religion. Having developed a very early cuneiform alphabet, many religious and mythological texts survived the Bronze Age collapse on clay tablets. This pretty vast literature provides us with an amazing glimpse into the religious literature of Canaan centuries before Israelite hegemony in the regions to the south. It is here in the myth cycles, the liturgical literature, and other fragments that the Rephaim first appear in history. Though, even by this early stage, their nature and identity seem to have been long since standardized. Even by the 14th century BCE, the Rephaim are already known to the writers. While never the star of the show, the Rephaim do pepper a range of texts, including central narratives like the Baal cycle, the legend of Akhat, and the tale of King Kirta, where they generally appear with a very similar group of traits. Oh, I should mention that many of these texts were actually written down by the same scribe, Ilamiku, whose signature on those tablets has given him it's given him a taste of immortality. He might be one of the Rephaim now. In these texts, dated to the 14th century BCE, the Rephaim seem to be a small set, perhaps less than 10, of semi-divine heroic warriors, seemingly the offspring of the chief god of the Canaanite pantheon, the elder god El. Here they're associated with riding in chariots, feasting at divine banquets, such as the famous and mysterious Marzeach, where El's actually said to have gotten so drunk that he, well, he crapped himself and then he fell into it. You, you know, the text actually ends with the world's first hangover cure, or at least one of the earliest hangover cures that we have, so there's that. Putting that over there, the Rephaim are also uh, said to have had a kind of brotherly kinship with a few being kings and righteous judges, such as the famed Daniel, who's actually going to reappear in the Hebrew Bible book of Ezekiel. That they are divine progeny, though, capable of dying, gives them the right to rule and judge with this theophoric Resh Pe Aleph being popular among Ugaritic names. The texts even indicate where they are said to have emerged somewhere in the Bashan region in what is now Lebanon and southern Syria. In fact, Psalm 65 in the Hebrew Bible seems to record a very ancient memory where El, again the main god of the Canaanite pantheon, first dwelled on a mountain in Bashan before being transferred for political and cultic reasons to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Indeed, this notion seems to be a reference to the period prior to the time before the fusion of Yahweh and El into a single deity. In a handful of Ugaritic liturgical texts, including a memorial for a deceased king and a coronation of a new king, we learn that previous, now deceased kings, actually stand up from their otherworldly thrones to greet now dead kings into the afterlife. Thus, it appears that while not all Rephaim were kings, kings may live as the descendants of the original Rephaim and then also go on to dwell with the deceased Rephaim in the afterlife. So you can be a Rephaim both here and in the afterlife. And this probably explains the ultimate origin of the term itself, something like flawless or perfected. In fact, the medical use of the root, Resh Pe Aleph, in the Ugaritic times for medical reasons is actually quite rare. Thus, already in the 14th century BCE, the concept of the Rephaim was rather stable. They were a cadre of heroic, semi-divine offspring of El, their kingly descendants in the Canaanite polity, along with the previous Rephaim that now dwelled in the Ugaritic afterlife. Phoenician references to the Rephaim, while much fewer, do add just a little to the older Ugaritic conception. 
Indeed, the appearance of Rephaim, the Rephaim theophoric elements in Phoenician names, is significantly smaller in the Phoenician context, which indicates that the Rephaim were not a substantial aspect of Phoenician cultic life. Though a pair of Phoenician sarcophagi, we are actually warned that anyone who disturbed the bodies within those sarcophagi will not be welcomed by the Rephaim in death. This warning appears to be targeted at fellow kings and other aristocrats who might desecrate the remains of the former king in a bid to establish their own legitimacy. Thus, again, we have the conception of the Rephaim as a special aristocratic cadre of deceased kings. In fact, it seems that by the Roman period, the Rephaim had actually been assimilated into the Manes, at least for North African Phoenicians, those living over there near Carthage. For those that know of the Rephaim primarily from the Hebrew Bible, the most notable elements of the Rephaim in those texts are, well, they're largely missing in this earlier stratus of text. While they can die and endure into the afterlife, most of the Rephaim here are very much alive in these earliest Ugaritic texts. Further, while they are heroic in nature, there's no reference to their being giants or otherwise monstrous. In fact, the opposite is true in these earliest texts. The Rephaim are praiseworthy, wise, and kingly, and they welcome people into death and this welcoming at least kings into the afterlife is among the very best afterlifes one can achieve, the join the Rephaim in death. Virtually the opposite in every respect to the depiction of the Rephaim in the Hebrew Bible, where they are monstrous giants, the constant enemies of Israel, and their doom in the afterlife is worthy of derision and mockery. Now, to understand this shift of the Rephaim in Israelite mythology, Let's explore how they appear in the surviving library of Israelite literature, the Hebrew Bible, also the Christian Old Testament. The Rephaim are mentioned about 30 times across 10 books of the Hebrew Bible, thus making them among the most attested supernatural beings, for want of a better word, in that text, next to members of the divine council, especially messenger beings such as angels. In fact, in many ways, the Rephaim come second to the angels in terms of references. Generally speaking, the Rephaim of the Hebrew Bible can be split into two distinct groups, living and dead Rephaim. Of the living Rephaim, a further subdivision is possible. Those that live over in the Transjordan, apparently the traditional home of the Rephaim, and those that live west of the Transjordan, especially their connections with the Philistines. The Rephaim of the Transjordan appear during the Abraham narratives in Genesis where the kings of the east defeat them in battle, only to reappear at the end of the Israelite journey to Canaan, where we learn that, in fact, they are giants, the first reference really to their gigantic stature in the literature. This is curious because in the earlier battle starring Abraham, which is probably the point of that story to make Abraham out to be a kind of heroic warrior, the alliance of the eastern king seems to pretty easily defeat them, and there's no mention made at that point of their stature, gigantic or otherwise. Of course, there are other giants mentioned across the Jordan. Famously, there are those that are said to make the Israelites look like grasshoppers in comparison, but they are not linked, at least here, with the Rephaim. In fact, this is all probably part of an elaborate rhetorical device to make all of Israelites enemies appear to be gigantic or otherwise monstrous to amplify the value of the eventual Israelite victory in the narrative. Lastly, we're also told of a specific member of the Rephaim that the forces of Moses encountered and defeated, the king Og of Bashan. While in the earlier narrative found in Numbers, Og is simply defeated along with his sons, nothing is really made about his size there, the later text in Deuteronomy makes him to be the last of the Rephaim, who stood about 14 feet tall or so, and whose famous bed, or Eres, which I actually think is probably a sarcophagus, could, at least according to the text, still be seen in the region of the Ammonites. Again, the point of this narrative, like the Abraham narrative, is to make Moses appear as a kind of heroic general, defeating the last of the Rephaim in their own homeland, 
Remember Og is king of Bashan, Bashan being the ancient Rephaite homeland. In fact, the text is at pains to point out the dimensions of the Rephaim's homeland in detail, focusing on the Transjordan cities of Ashtarot and Idre, sites also directly connected with the Canaanite god El in much older ancient Ugaritic texts. This shows Israelite familiarity with the traditional Rephaim tales, something that we see in the Israelite prophets in a moment, but that doesn't explain their subversion of just that narrative. While the more ancient narratives revel in the heroic victories of the Rephaim, the Israelite narrative hails their defeat and annihilation. We'll get to why in just a moment. Like the Western Rephaim of the Transjordan, the Eastern Rephaim are also primarily depicted as gigantic or otherwise monstrous enemies of the Israelites, here specifically associated with the Philistines. We learn that some of the elite Philistine warriors were the descendants of Harapha, especially Sipai, Lachmi, the man of Madon or Midi, depending on which text you're reading, and of course, Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear shaft was like a weaver's beam, which needs to be the title of a romance novel right now. These gigantic or otherwise monstrous Philistine descendants of the Rephaim, remember the otherwise unnamed man of Madon, it's said to have had 12 fingers and 12 toes, for instance, are again introduced into the narrative just to be just to be defeated by the Israelites. Specifically to here, the narrative is especially tortured because it appears that a guy named Elchanan is actually the first attested to kill Goliath, with the text eventually, let's call it, edited to give the youth David credit, which is probably part of a Davidic or later Judean kingly propaganda campaign or even told of a valley of the Rephaim raided by the Philistines just to the southwest of Jerusalem. In all these narratives, like those that take place in the Transjordan, the Rephaim are the Philistines linked with the Rephaim because of their stature and heroic prowess as warriors, are introduced into their narrative just to be killed by the Israelites in order to establish the heroic character of Israelite Rephaim heroes Abraham, Moses, and David, respectively. Thus, while the Rephaim as heroic warriors is retained, the Israelite writers seek to out-Rephaim them as heroes through the military defeat by specifically Israelite heroes. But note that in the Israelite mythology, the Rephaim have been transformed not only into giants, but as kind of malevolent giants. How did this come to pass exactly? Well, to tell the truth, the exact mechanism is obscure, but it's probably linked with the shift in Israelite mythology from the Pali and Henotheism of its earlier period to something much more like the monotheism as the text of the Hebrew Bible are finally redacted as we have them probably pretty late in their composition cycle, maybe even into the Greek and Persian periods. There seems to have been a shift where all semi-divine beings, including members of the divine council, such as the famous Satan, any divine consorts, like Asherah perhaps, the sons of God, and likely the Rephaim, were either demoted or worse, demonized as the full logic of monotheism was rigorously implemented. In this case specifically, the sons of God, probably literal sons of God at some level in the text, were quasi-divine beings who descended from the divine heavens to earth to mate with human women associated somehow with the famous Nephilim, or the ones that descended, or the fallen ones. This illicit mating, it seems, produced what the text called Hagiborim Me'olam An Shehashem, the heroes of olden times, the men of renown very likely a reference to the traditional concept of the Rephaim. In later myths, especially in Joshua, the descendants of these weird beings have somehow survived the flood, by the way, and now live as giants in Canaan as spotted by the Israelite spies. Also, there are some really great midrashim, or rabbinical legends, about how Og, king of Bashan, survived the flood by kind of hanging on to the ark and even kind of surfing on top of it 
needs to be a kid's cartoon. What seems to have happened here is that these two narratives became fused in time with the giant hood, giant hood, eventually also being transferred to the Rephaim, despite that not being a traditional attribute, especially as the role of the Rephaim was inverted in the narrative. No longer were they heroes to be praised, but heroes to be defeated, thus making their defeat as giants all the more stunning. I mean, it's one thing to defeat Rephaim, but it's another thing to defeat giant Rephaim. You can make them Rephaim. Thus it appears that in the general demotion of quasi-divine elements of earlier Israelite mythology, the Nephilim and the Rephaim undergo some kind of narrative cross-contamination in the interest of enhancing the Israelite military narrative, especially for Abraham, Moses, and of course our young boy David. So that's for the living Rephaim of the Hebrew Bible. What about the Rephaim in the realm of the dead? Like the living Rephaim, the Rephaim of the dead also function as witnesses to the power of Yahweh, especially over haughty non-Israelite earthly kings and the realm of the dead more generally. Again, it's clear that the writers of the Hebrew Bible were aware of the traditional Rephaim narrative. Recall that kings in the Ugaritic literature would be welcomed by the Rephaim in the realm of the dead, and they were highly praised, and this was a much desired afterlife in both Ugaritic and Phoenician myths. Remember that Phoenician sarcophagus warns that if you disturb it, you won't be welcomed by the Rephaim. But the Israelite writers actively sought to subvert this idea as part of their own theological agenda, that is, the unique divine supremacy of Yahweh. In the Israelite text, we find that the Rephaim in the Israelite afterlife, Sheol, but rather than them being the subject of praise, we're told that they dwell in the furthest reaches of the maggot-infested darkness, unremembered by Yahweh as a kind of punishment for their haughty pride during their lives. Here the Rephaim are associated with non-Israelite kings who sought to ascribe to themselves divine status, only to be brought down to the depths of Sheol, most famously in the prophecy against Nebuchadnezzar at Isaiah 9, of course, that passage where Halel bin Shachar, the morning star son of the dawn, seeks to become divine and is ultimately transformed into the fall of Satan or Lucifer in Christian mythology. In the Israelite worldview, such arrogant kings will never be forgiven or resurrected by Yahweh, thus forever proving that they are the very opposite of divine beings, dwelling forever among the worms of the grave forgotten and forsaken by the very light of life itself. Interestingly here, they are never mentioned as giants. In fact, none of the living Rephaim mentioned earlier are specifically mentioned by name in this pretty extreme, terrible afterlife, which is unusual given the normal ideas around Sheol in Israelite literature, showing that this aspect of the Rephaim, though inverted, is more similar to the traditional concept from ancient Canaan. Though it does appear that Ezekiel does allow one traditional member of the Rephaim to go on to fame, Danil, the judge famous for his compassion on lower social classes, and the father of Akkad, not to be confused with the Daniel of the eponymous book of the Hebrew Bible, though there probably are some literary links there. Specifically, Ezekiel mentions Daniel along with Noah and Job as especially righteous ancient people whose righteousness would nevertheless only save themselves and not their children. This establishes, by the way, at least in Jewish theology, that children cannot accrue either the righteousness nor the sins of their parents, with these verses often wielded against the Christian concept of original or inherited sin. Though not mentioned as a member of the Rephaim specifically in Ezekiel, this may be one of the only mentions of such beings in a positive light, in a positive way of thinking about the Rephaim in the entirety of the Hebrew Bible. From this extremely complicated narrative and linguistic interplay, it's much clearer now as to how the concept of the Rephaim became so confused in the centuries and millennia following the composition of the Hebrew Bible. 
And this is especially true as the memory of the earliest non-polemical layer of the Rephaim myth was lost in the ancient classical and late classical Near East with only the Hebrew Bible and its expositors as evidence for the nature of these beings. Thankfully, with the discovery of the Bronze Age Ugaritic and Phoenician text, along with a much better set of tools for understanding the literary and historical construction of the Hebrew Bible, we finally have a pretty good idea of the origin, nature, and convoluted fate of the Rephaim. This episode would have been impossible without the absolutely wonderful study of the Rephaim by Jonathan Rogev. He systematically explores every single mention of the Rephaim known to history in the original languages, along with any even slightly adjacent material that may bear on the overall subject matter. This, this is just the kind of scholarship that I honestly admire and adore, though in you know what's coming. Yeah, it's published by Brill. It's published by Brill. So you too could descend into the afterlife of poverty by buying a copy. Fun. Also, if you'd like to read some of these great myths from ancient Ugarit, from ancient Canaan, the best and affordable, affordable. Hear that, Brill? Affordable. Is that a word that you know? The best and affordable collection is by Coogan in Stories from Ancient Canaan. It's really wonderfully accessible with a great introduction covering virtually all of the texts that I've mentioned in this episode. So go read some Canaanite literature. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge. Thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. <laughs>